Hello, my name's Dr Chris Darby, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the first part of our Naughty Dog special. Over the next few weeks, each of us here at In Retrospect will present a chapter of this seminal company's history, culminating in a group discussion as to where we think they are going. Today we know them as the company that have created successful games such as the Uncharted series and the recent critically acclaimed The Last of Us. But I want to go back to where it all began. To a friendship between two teenagers named Jason and Andy, and a road trip that sowed the seeds for their first big gaming franchise, Crash Bandicoot. It's a fascinating story, and who better to tell it than one of those same teenagers? Therefore join me as I sit down with Naughty Dog's co-founder, Jason Rubin, as we discuss the beginnings of this influential company and the road to Crash. see LA but LA is out there wow basically I, I spent 45 minutes in LA changing, oh. changing flights and I was That's going to New, New Zealand you've lived what if you've lived there since 94 95 is that correct Andy and I came out in 94 yeah so it's been quite a while yeah he that's incredible because that, that I mean it's basically I've spent my life in LA I was in school before that, and I was a kid growing up in D.C., but I basically spent my life in L.A. Before we talk about Crash, I was just wondering if you'd like to just talk about how Naughty Dog began um, and how this sort of led to the development of Crash. Very simple, uh, mundane question. The title, Naughty Dog. Yeah, you know, and that's the question we get the most often, but it's one of the hardest for us to answer because we were 15 when we were 16 when we changed the name. Could have been 17, so don't quote me. I know the fact checkers on the web are, are vicious. So <laughs> basically, when we signed with Electronic Arts, we started as Jam Software, yeah. which was horrible. We had a, a partner named Mike who gave us $127 to buy a piece of software. Um, and so he was a third owner of the company, even though he didn't know anything about making video games, programming art, or anything like that. And so we bought him back out for $127 plus something, maybe three months later, uh, so we had this dangling M because it was Jason, Andy, Mike, Jam Software. And so we came up with Jason and Andy's magic, which oh, it's, it, makes me cr- <laughs> it makes me cringe at this point. But remember, we're 15. It's yeah. 85. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we went with that name for two years and produced a game called um, Ski Craze, which I wrote in a weekend and Andy edited in two days. And then a game called Dream Zone, which was a bigger production, took a longer time. Um And then we went to, we cold called Electronic Arts, literally just called the front desk and said, we'd like to make video games. Can we speak to a producer? And they said, sure, hold. And we spoke to a guy named Chris. And Chris said, well, have you made games before? And we said, yes. And we played, we made these two games. And coincidentally, because no one played our first two games, he liked Dream Zone. So he said, awesome, let's, let's meet. And we progressed very quickly because I think we were extremely cheap. Uh, into a contract to make a game for them that that turned into Keith the Thief. And the sticking point was that my father, who's an intellectual properties and trade and uh, and uh, and uh, and trademark attorney, went and looked at Jam Software and we couldn't register it. Up until that point, we had been acting as Jam Software, but we couldn't get a registered trademark as Jam Software because there was an Australian game company called Jam Software or something along those lines. So we had to come up with a new name. And we wanted to sign the contract. And I remember having 24 hours to come up with a name. And so Andy and I did what anyone else would do. Uh, Having gone through Jam Software, we said, okay, micro this and and computer that, compu that. And, you know, the names from Interplay, uh, Microprose, all of those names were were basically made in the same way. And we hated them. And we didn't want to be one of those companies. So we said, well, what else can we do? And 
we just out of the blue picked the name Naughty Dog. I wish there was a great story, but there really isn't behind that. We yes. love dogs. We thought it was great. And I remember Trip Hawkins, who went on to form, well, he was Electronic Arts founder, 3DO, uh, Digital Chocolate. I mean, a, a, a giant in the industry said, guys, love you, love the games, hate the name. And we said, we like it. And we went with it. And I, we, I like to say that we were the first uh, crazy name, if you will, yeah. the name that wasn't so computerized. And it really worked for us because people realized um, – you know, realize that we that, that we were different, I guess, or something along those lines. Fantastic. So I think that that's the best story I can tell. I, I don't remember why we chose it, but I do remember choosing it in earnest yeah. and very, very, very under a lot of pressure and liking the idea that it was different. Okay, so you did Keep the Thief, and then what? Ring of Power followed from that. That's right. Keep the Thief was for various types of desktop computer. Yeah. And Andy and I had never thought about consoles. We liked console games, but we were kind of PC game makers. Um, and uh, we were walking through Electronic Arts offices, and Andy saw some silver box with a bunch of cables sticking out of it attached to somebody's computer. It looked like homebrew. I mean, it was, it was you know, com- parts everywhere. And he said, that looks like a reverse-engineered Sega Genesis. And uh, they immediately raced us into a room, put, you know, documents in front of us that you won't, you won't say this, you won't say that, uh, because they were reverse – Electronic Arts was reverse-engineering the Sega Genesis in order to avoid paying – um, the $8 or whatever it was a unit or more that Sega wanted and managed to get an incredibly good deal on Genesis based on that fact. But at this time, nobody knew about it. We were probably the sixth or seventh group to know about it. Right. So, um, you know, so they put us in this room and Andy said, well, I think our game would be good on cartridge. I think it would be good on Genesis. And they said, uh, not really. I think we probably should stick with PC. And we said, no, we really want to make it ge- Genesis. And I think they got the idea that we were going to raise a stink or something. So they said, fine, it's a Genesis game. So we became the third signed Genesis product for Electronic Arts. I think we came out 10th or 11th. We were much later because it was a long, big project. But we were the third side one after, I think, uh, Mar- uh, Zany Golf, maybe, and Budokan. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, again, fact checkers will yeah, yeah, yeah. tear me apart on that, <laughs> but I think those were the first two games. I mean, uh, Rings of Power came out in '91, so we were working on it from '89 to '91. Um, so we must have had the kits probably in late '89, early '90, I would guess. Andy's the date guy; he he'll give you the exact dates, but <laughs> roughly speaking, yeah, it was somewhere around there. And this is all. So I was 19. At the time we started Rings of Power, Keith the Thief was finished, began when I was in high school in D.C. and finished when I was in college at Michigan. Andy was at Haverford in Pennsylvania. We were telecommuting before telecommuting were cool. We were like original hipsters because we were using dial-up modems, 1,200-baud modems to pass data back and forth between our two colleges. And so we, we were kind of – we started this game when I was at Michigan and Andy was in, uh, was in Haverford, Pennsylvania. And we worked on it not spending most of the time together, but getting a huge amount of work done in the summers when we went back to D.C. and we lived across uh, the Potomac River from each other. Ring of Power went to Way of the Warrior, which was a big one. Right. So after Rings of Power, well, Rings of Power came out we loved it as a game. Andy wrote it. It was it was really Andy's baby, and I was the artist. Huge project, three years, massive. It took tons of time to solve. One of the biggest games of the time was one of the biggest cartridges made at that time, uh, a ridiculously small amount of memory now, but at that time cost a lot. It also had an EE prom in it to save the game. So between those two things, it was one of the most expensive cartridges Electronic Arts had to put out. So what happened is EA put it out, sold out very quickly because people loved RPGs and and they really liked the game. But uh, they got on the phone with us and they're like, hey, guys, you sold out 50, somewhere around 50,000 units in a few weeks. 
awesome, good job. And we're like, that's amazing. We, we we're going to make real money on this. <laughs> so you're reprinting, right? And they said, no, no, there's this other game. Sorry to say it, but there's this other game. And look, it's like five, seven dollars cheaper a cartridge. And Sega's only letting us print so many cartridges at a time. So we're just going to print all this other game. And, you know, maybe somewhere down the road, if that game stops selling, we'll print some more of your cartridges. But that's basically all you're ever going to sell. And that game was Madden. It was the first Madden. So Madden <laughs> crushed us. Not yeah. because it was selling better. That, I mean, obviously, it was selling a lot better than we were. But it crushed us because it was a cheaper cartridge to make. Mm-hmm. So just from a business standpoint, EA had to make the decision uh, what they were going to do. And so Andy and I were distraught. I mean, yeah. we made probably, I, I added picking a number out of the air, probably $50,000 each, which is a huge amount for you know, a, a guy coming out of college or, yeah. or you know, in the late stages of college. But it's still, it was like, you know, we spent three years on this thing and it's not getting reprinted, even though people like it because of the fact that it's a big cartridge. Andy wanted to become a professor. I wanted to go into the special effects industry or do something else. I wanted to move to California. Andy went to MIT. So we stopped making games for, I think, a period of about nine months. Uh, and I actually went off to, to Southern California with a couple of my fraternity brothers uh, set up a special effects studio, did some work on the Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton inaugural video. Seriously? Like five, <laughs> five seconds of, of Bill Clinton inaugural <laughs> stuff. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I was just a game maker. So I started talking to people uh, in the special effects industry and managed to get an offer to do the transformation sequence to Wolf, which was a movie with Michelle Pfeiffer and Jack Nicholson. Yes, of Satan's. And and basically what I did uh, at that time, there was this big new technology called morphing and everybody took two still images and moved a bunch of dots around and created these. I mean, today you would laugh if you saw this this transformation, you know, between two faces and no one had done a moving morph or at least nobody had a good way of doing a movie morph, a moving morph, meaning it was actual video, not a still that froze and and changed. And I showed this technology and. Someone gave me the basically an offer to do the uh, the a transformation scene on on Wolf, and the secret to my technology was I stayed up all night, three nights in a row, doing a bunch of still morphs back to back, and I had this this way of drawing dots on the screen so I knew where the other points were in the previous shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was literally the ultimate non-technical way of getting into it. But, but it impressed them because they had never seen something like that, and they figured I had some technology, so I got the job. Uh, and was all, about to sign the, the contract to do it when uh, Trip Hawkins or, or somebody that worked at 3DO called us and said, "Let us send you our um, let us send you a 3DO development kit. You really ought to take a look at this thing. Hey, we know how screwed you were on on you know <laughs> Rings of Power. This is a CD. It can't happen again. Look at how much memory you'll have to play with," and sucked us right back in. So I moved to Boston with Andy. Uh, we worked on on some stuff back and forth, and eventually I just had to move to Andy. I said, come to the beach. He said, I'm a master's degree. And I said, all right, that kind of trumps the beach. Moved to to uh, to him, and, and that's what we ended up doing. We, we ended up making Way of the Warrior. And then you sold the rights to Universal, which kind of brings us a step closer to Crash. That's right. Yeah. We, we basically worked on this thing together because we had been given free 3do kits and we had no publisher i put all of the money that i had remaining from um you know living at the beach that had come out of rings of power um and andy you know had about the same amount of money and we put eighty thousand dollars uh into the game and you know probably our living expenses whatever uh you know we were eating frozen burritos and, and and i remember getting ramen noodle packets for under a nickel uh, if you bought them by pallet. Yeah. So that tells you how <laughs> broke we were. I, I actually, during Way of the Warrior, I ran out of a light bulb in my room. It was one of those $15 halogen lamps that you can buy uh, these days at Walmart. And the light bulb burned out, and the light bulb itself was like $15 to replace. And I, so I lived in the dark in my bedroom for, for time. We were utterly broke. Um, but in any event, that title... Uh, was the only title that wasn't attached to a publisher at the time that was decent. So at a, at a CES show, which is like kind of an old E3, if you will, um, we showed up and we spent $10,000 on a three-by-three-foot part of 3DO's booth, so nine square feet for $10,000 out of the 80 grand, yeah. uh, to show the game. And everybody was like, whoa, 
we're all making this multimedia stuff with videos and and all this other stuff. Here's an old school game that's good. There's no other fighting game that's decent on the 3DO, Bidding War. And long story short, uh, we liked Universal. We liked the story of moving to their back lot to work on titles for them. We liked the people that were working there, especially Skip Paul, who we still work with uh, on various things and is, is a very, very close friend. Um, so we moved, we packed up everything in a car, my dog included, drove out to L.A. Um, which is you know, a, to work with them. Which is a, a hell of a journey. I mean, for people who aren't aware of the scale of that, that is about 3,000 miles. It's about 3,000 miles. Coast. I've done it four times. Uh, I just did it about a year and a half ago. Um, it's, it takes you 36 hours, roughly, if you want to get from the Northeast to, to Los Angeles. I mean, to, to put it in perspective, I looked it up once. It's something like Moscow to, to Lisbon. Like it's, it's vaguely, I, again, the fact checkers will tell me I'm off by 10% or something, but vaguely speaking, it's something like, it's, it's a long distance. Yeah. And it worked to our favor because Andy and I had to come up with what title we were doing next as we were going out to LA. And we, we, we had successfully ripped off, and, I, and I've said this to Boone, and I haven't ever spoken to Tobias, but I've told this to Boone. We successfully ripped off Mortal Kombat with uh with way of the warrior um and had done quite well with it even though obviously it was never up to mortal Kombat's uh, standards so we thought now we have a real budget we're not putting 80 grand in we're going to have mil a million or more dollars to put into this game um we have employees we have you know talent that's andy and i don't have that we can do to polish the edges that we don't uh ourselves professionally have the ability to do Let's tackle something bigger. And instead of doing a, a pure ripoff, because, again, I, I've admitted this to them personally, <laughs> or to, personally, it was pretty much a dead ripoff. Instead of doing that, let's try to take a genre and move it into the future. And we chose character action games. talked about the fact that 3DO pretended to be a 3D system, but the next generation of, of systems, um, you know, the PlayStation, uh, Sega's console, and at that time there wasn't much of a rumor of it, but eventually we knew Nintendo would make 3D systems. They would have the capability of doing something truly interesting in 3D. Um, how would you take Mario, Donkey Kong Country, Sonic, um, those games, and make them 3D? And at the same time, I would imagine... Uh, or at least I like to believe the same discussion was going on with Nakayama's team at Sega and was going on with Miyamoto's team uh, at Nintendo. And we kind of took the tack that you take a, a game that's side-scrolling and you just turn it in 3D and still limit the player's uh, left-right movement in the same way that the in-and-out-of-screen movement is restricted on a 2D and it's 3D because things are coming at you, but it, the gameplay is much more constrained, so we can create the the interest that and the and the timing puzzles that you can create in 2D. The problem we realized was that you would be looking at the back of the character all the time. So we named this idea Sonic's Ass because <laughs> you would be looking at Sonic's Ass the whole time, and thought, what can we do to fix that problem? And eventually, the fixes we came up with, not on this trip, that was about where we got on this trip, was running into the screen from the boulder so you could see his face and keeping some side scrolling uh, scenes so that you can see his side. And that became our expression of the first person action game in 3D. Now, totally different tack was taken by Miyamoto, who said, let's open it up and go yeah. wild, which eventually I think became the dominant way of doing it. And Naka, who took kind of the other direction and said, I'm literally going to make a 2D game, but in 3D. 
So the yeah. technology is 3D, the rendering is 3D, but the game itself is utterly 2D. And I believe, again, this is my utterly my opinion, that he may have said, I don't feel comfortable with this, so let's create a new character and not do it with Sonic. And that's what Knights was. That's yeah. I'm making that up, but yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the way I see the, the... Knowing what I know about what was going on then... Um, and having spoken to you know people, I, that may have been why we ended up with Knights and not a Sonic. He may have said, "This isn't. I'm not comfortable enough with this idea to make it Sonic. Let's do something else." Or maybe he was inspired. I don't know. But um, that was the game that ended up becoming Crash Bandicoot. Now across the country, we had a thousand other ideas. Ideas. I remember uh, Allosaurus and Dinosign. Right. What? Allosaurus and Dynstein were the names of the character. It was a back to the future with two guys who have their DNA crossed with dinosaurs. And one was Al Asaurus, the young guy, and Dynstein was the back to the future old curly headed guy. Right. So Crash didn't come for a long time. This was all about the technology of moving it into 3D and how exactly we would do that. Uh, Crash was a process that took a lot more people and and was done much later after we had started toying around with the actual code and technology. But it was that journey across the country that was the seed of, of the ideas of the game. So you, you began with the mechanics, as it were. Everything was led by the mechanics. What came next in that process? Well, it took a long time to get the mechanics right. And, you know, Andy and, the, and Dave Baggett, who was a programmer uh, on that title, spent a long time working on it. And Mark Cerny, who... We all now know as uh, creator of PlayStation 4, but at the time was uh, our producer on Crash Bandicoot, was heavily involved in getting the mechanics work. And it didn't come immediately. We spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how to get it to, to work from a gameplay standpoint. It's easy to just envision it. It's another thing entirely to get it working on a system that allowed 3,000 polygons per frame. Think about that. Crash was 532. I modeled him. So he was taking roughly a sixth of the total polygons you could draw. The rest had to be in the background. Um, how you would set that up with tricks and turns in the, in the, uh, in the path so that you couldn't see off into infinity because we simply couldn't handle it. And we wanted to minimize the use of fog, which at that time was kind of the shortcut to yeah. getting away with things. Um, we didn't like that look. We used it in a couple places, but we didn't love that look, so we tried to avoid it. Um, there was a lot of work that went on. And then, uh, slowly but surely, we got to the point where we had to design a character. And that process was incredibly painful. It took a long amount of time. One thing we decided, um, we started off with all trying to do all the normal levels, like lava pits and everything like that. But we thought, it's so hard to draw this character with the number of polygons we have. <laughs> we should do things to make sure that he stands out and you understand the character. So, for example... His face has to be huge because it was a 320-240 system, roughly. I mean, it, we, we, I think we used a higher resolution uh, horizontally in some of the later games. But roughly speaking, that's what it was. And if you divide the screen into your character size, there are times where the eyeballs, if they're small enough, are either white and you can see them or they're not white because they're, they're in between. They're too small to draw effectively. So he has to have huge eyes. He has to have a huge mouth. We want to show expression, which had really never been done in a character action game before. And so... We had this vision of him turning around and doing multiple faces to the camera before the game even started. And that happens on the beach. But to see that, the face had to be big, right? What color is he going to be? We had a huge palette of colors, but the lighting was so bad that it all tended to end up being a mush on the PlayStation. So if he's going to be green, we can't do leaves because you won't be able to distinguish him from the leaves. So let's pick a color for him based on all of the level backgrounds that we want to do, what color isn't used in them. So if we do green and trees and beach and desert, that's the beiges and the greens. Okay, what are, we're doing grays. It can't be gray. There's water that's blue. And we ended up with orange. And the reason is because that's also orange. So there's early demo levels where you can see lava in the background, but we were trying to mute the orange so it didn't overpower crash. And that's eventually why we skipped the, the oranges. So we had that. You're looking at them from behind. So we're not using textures on Crash because polygons with textures drag, uh, draw too slow. But we're going to spend a few textures on him, putting spots on his back, and waste some polygons on a spike on the top of his head so that you have something to look at besides this orange light bulb, effectively, from the back. Right. So little things like that. 
he's going to have black gloves. Why does he have black gloves? That's a waste of polygons because every every line that divides his glove from his fingers is an added added uh, line. It's added vertices. Well, the answer is because when an orange arm crosses an orange body on the PlayStation with its horrible lighting, you basically lose it. Yeah. You can't see it. But you can track the black glove and your mind fills in the rest. So like Mario's nose is big because they either had it or they didn't in yeah. the number of pixels he originally had, we have things about Crash that were dictated by the size of the screen, the resolution of the screen, the color, more important than the color, the lighting and how it affected color. So we started working with that. And then from a pure design standpoint, we thought we have no, no ability to do this on our own. So let's hire some very talented uh, Hollywood cartoon uh, designers who design characters, uh, Fievel from Fievel Goes West and many television shows that you would know, um, you know, Disney, Warner Brothers, that kind of stuff named uh, Charles Zembalist and Joe Pearson. Let's hire them and have them help us create characters that look good. And of course, it was a it was a back and forth because they would draw something that was beautiful on paper, but wouldn't work in 3D. Or they would draw something that was beautiful on paper, but was too detailed or or just, you know, wouldn't work from our technical standpoints. So we very collaboratively went back and forth on this, uh, also using Bob Raffi, who, who was, uh, you know, our lead artist. Um, and a group of about six or seven of us sat around for months at a time going back and forth and breeding characters. We like the shoes of this guy. We like the face of that guy until eventually we ended up with something uh, that we now know as Crash Bandicoot. And of course, the original sketch of Crash Bandicoot, Charles Zembalist did, but it came from an ever uh, you know, preceding sequence of decisions made by Charles and Joe, certainly, but also by us. Uh, so the look and feel is, you know, it's Charles and Joe, but it's also in, in collaboration with the Naughty Dogs. And then we had the naming problem, and that took another four months to solve. And, and frankly, Naughty Dog almost walked out on Universal yes. because they they decided it was going to be either Wes Wombat or Wuzzles Wombat. Wombat wasn't their choice. That was Naughty Dog's choice. We we kind of started with Willy Wombat, knowing it was the worst name in the world and we'd never go with it. So it was a placeholder which yeah. is dangerous because I found if you if you put a placeholder in that you don't like, eventually you'll like it and default to it. So we don't do that anymore. Um, and eventually there was a Willy Wombat game. Someone else did a game based on Willy Wombat. I didn't know that. Uh, but they liked Wes, Wuzzles, these kids' names, and we didn't like that. We thought we should target a you know, broader audience, and uh, you know, we liked the Bandicoot name. We thought that was very cool. Uh, we had a Bandicoot in the game, Pinstripe Potteroo. Uh, the mafia boss yeah. was actually a bandicoot. He was a striped bandicoot when we started. We stole his name, made him a potteroo, and made Crash a bandicoot. And he looks more like a bandicoot than a wombat anyway. And Crash was a last-minute piece of brilliance that came from, I think, Dave Baggett and Taylor Kurosaki. They said he smashed it through boxes. Crash is a great name. Crash bandicoot. Because it was, it didn't, it didn't alliterate, right? It wasn't Willy Wombat like everything yeah. else that had been done. Uh, Sonic Hedgehog obviously didn't uh, alliterate either, but we loved it, and we pushed and pushed and pushed, and it came to the point where it was either Universal's way or ours, and we weren't going to work on Wessel's one or was or whatever <laughs> Wombat. So we threatened to walk out, and we ended up with our name. So, because that the crates themselves also came from that, that trying to balance the polygons with the aesthetics, and there I love the fact that from this kind of juggling back and forth, this plate spinning, you you created some really iconic ingredients. The crates, yeah, themselves are... you know the the crates were we were we were probably a month or two away from our first E3. We were pre-alpha, almost alpha, racing. We the hours we were working were insane. And I was playing the game, and it had most of the ingredients that you see in the early levels were in there. The problem we had was that, again, 3,000 polygons of frame, which, by the way, was huge for the PlayStation. Most engines were pushing 2,000 or less, so we were killing it with 3,000. Um, we also had an occlusion system that ran through the game and figured out every polygon not to draw, which took overnight, um, that was an incredible benefit to us because 3,000 visible polygons as opposed to 3,000 polygons, many of which are behind other polygons or off screen, radically, radically different in, in terms of the visuals. Um, but I was running through the game, and we had this problem that pits were easy because they didn't take a lot of polygons, but enemies were not easy because 
any enemy takes a lot of polygons. A sphere, 64 polygons, makes about uh, the minimum sphere you can get and make it look like a sphere. So, you know, you're, you're using a lot of polygons, and they're also animated. So there's a lot more going on there than the background polygons, and they're not pre-occluded, like I said the, the backgrounds were, because we couldn't, we didn't have the technology to do that. So we were drawing the front side, the back side, you know, whatever. It was, it was expensive to draw characters. And so we could put a couple on the screen, but if they were together to create a puzzle, like two turtles walking back and forth across the path, it was a while until we could put the next two turtles on the screen. And we could put a pit in between, but we couldn't do much more. And it was kind of empty. And I was spending a long time running down empty paths. And I thought, there has to be something we can do here. And we had always had the idea of putting fruit around, but we fruit, you know, they were flat. They weren't actually polygons. They were spinning pre-animated flat things. Um, but still, you have 10 fruit. That's 10 flat things, whereas a, a crate would be less. So came up with the idea of putting the crate in. And Andy hacked it together basically overnight, and it was fun. So then we came up with the idea of the exploding ones, the question mark ones, the timed ones, you know, all these different invisible ones, all these different things. And it became a big part of the game and eventually became his name, Crash, because he goes through these things. Um, it was just a moment of perhaps genius yeah. uh, that were utterly not planned for. And I remember Mark Cerny, you know, bless his heart, he's a genius. And I don't mean to say in any way he, he was doing wrong by doing this. But as our producer, he came in and said, what the hell are you doing? You're late for Alpha. Your hours are crazy. <laughs> you're not going to make it. We have E3 in a month and a half, and you're adding stuff to the game. This is stupid. Sure enough, it became one of the secrets to the game. And I would say, I would argue that one of the major flaws we had with Jack and Daxter is that we didn't put in the boxes. Uh, Ratchet and Clank, yes, Ratchet which and Clank, yeah. did ended up using them they're fun yeah and we we created them and then dropped them <laughs> but they're so simple and so elemental and so elegant i mean i love the idea that everything came from some from a restriction you were hampered by the hardware but to many you were creating an impossible game here um when you went to e3 people's reactions like from seeing this game you i mean you were hacking the hardware really to do it i mean andy was talking about the fact that sony themselves couldn't create that level of complexion in their own hardware it was something yeah. that you were doing you guys yeah the, the complexity level i mean sony remember naughty dog had a three project deal with universal so even though we became very close with sony loved sony loved working with sony they were always worried that universal was going to take the character because universal owned it to another hardware as eventually they did so internally, they set up a team to make uh, a game called Harry Jalapeno. Yeah. I don't know if it would have been that, but it was a guy with a flaming jalapeno head. Uh, and they put a bunch of their best engineers on it, and they couldn't create the look that we had created. And that was, that was A, the talent of Dave and Andy, but it was also the fact that we had this pre-occlusion system that no one else had really figured out, uh, and it made a massive difference. It made a massive, massive difference. And it's the reason that we were so lush – uh, and most of the other games weren't. And if you compare it to Mario, it couldn't pre-occlude because the camera moved in a different way. If you keep a camera on a path, you can rotate and it doesn't change the occlusion as long as it's on the path. So you can pre-calculate it. But with Mario, there is no path. The camera can go anywhere. So they couldn't do that. And that created a, a restriction on the number of polygons that they could have, which created levels that were much more basic. So from a purely visual standpoint, I'm not making a judgment between Crash and Mario as a game, but from a purely visual standpoint, standing there as you would have back then, uh, never having seen games with the lushness of Crash, uh, now we look back and it looks terrible. But, you know, at that time, we competed with, with Mario visually, and it just blew people away. Um, and we were also lucky because we, Andy and I had signed a development deal with Sony that allowed us to make games on the hardware but didn't require us to report what we were making. Whereas every publisher deal uh, required the publisher to do a presentation and say, this is the title we're going to make. Uh, and of course, Sony approved most things, but they were aware of them. So had we been a publisher and gone and said, we're going to make the character action game that eventually becomes the mascot of the PlayStation, they would have said, no, we don't want a mascot, but we probably should be making one of those internally. And they might have gone off and done it, but we kept it secret. So it wasn't until just about when we put the boxes in right before Alpha that we eventually showed Sony uh, the
and behold, we had drove and driven cross country and decided we were going to try to make, you know, the, the next 3D character action game. Sony hadn't thought of it. They hadn't thought to do a character action game. So they looked at, I forgot, Crystal Dynamics had a game. Forgot what the name of it is. Um, and they offered to sell it to Sony, and Sony was willing to buy it, but not for the price Crystal Dynamics wanted. Uh, and then all of a sudden we pop up. And they're, they're like, this is it. This is the game we need. Universal was going to be our publisher. But Sony said, we have to have this product front and center. This is, this is our proof that we're a competitive hardware for Nintendo and Sega. This game competes visually uh, with Mario. Um, and again, I'm not making a judgment on the games there. I'm just saying, at the time, visually and from other, there were arguments that it was better. And so they cut an amazing deal with Universal, for Universal, that is. Um, to become the publisher. The unhappy result of that was that as developers, um, we had contracted to get 30% of what Universal brought in uh, as the publisher. When they became effectively the producer, we ended up with 30% of their X percent that Sony got. So we ended up with significantly less dollars per unit, uh, which eventually became the driving force behind all of the hostility between Universal and Naughty Dog that eventually broke up that relationship. Um, we just didn't understand why some other developer doing the same game would get double or more what we were getting uh, per unit. Even though we were doing very well, we decided with Jack and Daxter, hey, let's go off and do it on our own. And half of the way through making that game, Sony said, sounds great. You could go off, do it on your own. But we're not making the mistake again of doing somebody else's IP as a, as a center of our platform. Uh, so let's just merge. Let, let us buy you. Uh, and that's that's how that relationship ended up uh, coming together. We, we loved Sony. So we were yeah, we, yeah. at that time, we never thought Naughty Dog would move from Sony. So the difference between being a contractor with Sony and being internal at Sony was, you know, it, it wasn't that big a deal. did you yourself learn from seeing the competition at E3 and how did that influence the final kind of changes you made to Crash? Right. Well, the, the, the month or two before, three months before E3 was incredibly stressful for us. First of all, we added the crate. Second of all, we showed the game for the first time to Sony. Third of all, we were told that we would fail because we were Gaijin creators. Uh, Sony had a list of things they liked and didn't like about Crash compared to others. We were the Gaijin Miyamoto and Naka were not, so that was a negative one for us. So we were going through massive amounts of, of hoop jumping to make sure that the character worked in Japan. It was really Sony America wanted it. Sony Japan was, eh, you know, it's not, it's not for us. And we did a huge amount of work to get the character to work for Japan. But at the, at the same time, for the first time, Nintendo's Mario game was leaking out and was getting announced. And we started to see the open world and we started to see uh, kind of the sandbox that Miyamoto had created and how that differed from what we had created. Uh, and we really didn't know how people would react uh, to those changes. I think there were compelling arguments for both. I still believe the classic platform game with a force to go through a certain number of puzzles set up in a very specific manner to challenge you in a very specific way has an incredible amount of... Uh, uh, you know, validity and still shows up now on mobile platforms and people still love that kind of game. But ultimately, uh, the open world that Miyamoto created, uh, it became Grand Theft Auto, if you will, right? And that is also incredibly compelling. Um, and it was clearly going to be incredibly compelling. Uh, so going to E3, first of all, we were told by Universal at the last minute, you can't go to E3 and we're not putting your name on the box and we're not going to mention you at E3. Uh, which was contrary to our contract and made absolutely no sense. So I went out and I printed 8,000 flyers that told the story of the creation of Crash Bandicoot and said, I'm, I don't work for Universal. I'm a contractor. It says in my contract, my name's on the box. We're going to put our name on the box, and I'm going to be standing in front of the booth handing these out. And here are the eight people working at Naughty Dog standing in your office, Mr. Executive Vice President of Universal Interactive Studio. We'll go home today. And you won't have something to show at E3 
if you don't accept that fact. And he bet. Brilliant. That was after the naming problem. This was the second time we did the exact same thing, which is to say, we're not assholes. But look, this is not going to be a universal creation and we're the guys in the back room that you're not going to mention. This is a Naughty Dog product. We're the ones doing all of the hard work. Um, all of this was incredibly stressful to Mark Cerny because he was one of us. You know, he was the creator side. He was there every day working hard. But then he saw us being ab abused. And technically, he was our producer at Universal. So very, very hard for Mark. But it, eventually, I think it's obvious which side he chose as he came on and continued to work with Naughty Dog and how much we loved him because we continued to work with him through the Jack and Daxter series and, 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 and Naughty Dog did afterwards as well. Um, but this was an incredibly hard period. I think it finally came home what had happened when we watched Miyamoto play Crash. And there is a, there is a photo of that. I, I could Google it. I'm sure it's online. I probably have it somewhere on my drives. There is a, an image of Mark Cerny standing next, because he speaks fluid Japanese, standing next to Miyamoto-san as he played Crash Bandicoot. And I'd like to say the look in his eye was not, I'm defeated. He was not in any way defeated. But it was, this is damn good. <laughs> this, this could be trouble, right? This is yeah. not, I can't dismiss this offhand. This, this is pretty good. Um, and seeing literally one of my, uh, one of my gods, if you will, play my game and, and the face that said, this, this could be trouble, uh, was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I think Andy's in the photo too, if you, if you can find it. If not, I'll dig it up. I'm sure I have it somewhere in my drives, but, uh, that was the magic moment at E3. And, of course, Sony had taken uh, one of their key games and moved it off front and center and put Crash there instead. So, you know, it was amazing. We were, we were literally right across from Mario. It was head-to-head -head competition wow. as people came through. It was the first time that they had seen uh, the Nintendo 64, and it was the first time they had seen Crash. And it was, it was, it was quite an experience. After all that stress, E3 was a real confidence booster for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then, then the reviews started coming out of the two titles and, you know, Miyamoto was Miyamoto. So a lot of the reviews of Crash were, it just isn't this, it just isn't that. And it's just not Nintendo, which we were never trying to be. Yeah. Um, and I think if you look at Crash's review scores when it finally came out, we were fighting the fact that we weren't Miyamoto and we weren't Nintendo. And that impacted us negatively. If you go back and read the reviews, they made it perfectly clear that that, that was one of the negative three points. You're not Nintendo. Um, and we overcame that over time. You know, Crash outsold Mario. Yeah. Uh, and over time, people started thinking of Naughty Dog not as this upstart underdog that was somehow discrediting Miyamoto because we weren't at all. A good game does not discredit another fantastic game in any way. Um, we were just making really good games that people really wanted to play. And... I think Naughty Dog gets benefit of that now as somebody comes and tries to uh, do whatever Naughty Dog's doing. People go, well, it's not Uncharted. Well, of yes. course it's not yes. Uncharted. And, and that's it's an unfortunate part of being the guy that's new or the, the girl that's new at the show. Right. You have to compete to um, to get people's respect beyond just what they see. You have to get the respect that you're you're, you're worth covering in a way. Um, and that happened slowly over that first year with Crash. And by the time Crash 2 came out. We didn't face any of that anymore. It was, this is Crash. This is Naughty Dog. It's going to be great. Um, and that benefited us and still benefits Naughty Dog. From when I was reading the account, Crash really started off almost as being like this unofficial mascot. And... It's something that a mascot has been picked up and accepted by everyone. I mean, at the PlayStation 4 unveiling, there he was up there on the screen as well. Um, he's such a, an important part. I mean, the Simpsons themselves have mentioned Crash Bandicoot. He's, a, he's an important Dash part. Dash Dingo. Dash Dingo. Lisa gets addicted to her. It's an important part of American culture. Um, yeah. Uh, Andy said that, for him, Crash was the last of the video game mascots. And I was just wondering if you agree with that fact. And if so, why do you think that was? Well, Sony, I think yes and no at the same time. And Sony, what Sony said is exactly, is answers that question precisely. Sony said, we don't have a mascot. Because when you were playing the Nintendo systems prior to the Nintendo 64, you were probably 16 and under. And to sell those systems, 
you, sh you put a mask on on it because the, the young gamer, the child doesn't have an ability to look at the system and say, here's its specs, here's what I'm getting out of it. So they buy it because they like Mario. The PlayStation was the first hardware that broke through that and became a game system for children, of course, but adults as well. And an adult who, for example, loves Madden um, isn't going to buy the system because Crash is on it. They may never play Crash, whereas most Nintendo people would they're going to play a Mario game. A lot of PlayStation owners never played Crash. Um, I think at the end of the day, we were probably at, at, at ever one in one in five or one in six to the hardware, which was huge. We were five percent. Sony Crash was five percent of all PlayStation One software. So one in 20 titles was a Crash title, which is unbelievable. It's incredible. But there were still a lot of people who were not playing Crash. And they had a different theory about game systems, that they were not kids' toys, but that they were eventually going to be in living rooms and played by adults, uh, not on the kids' TV in the kids' room or not something that the parents doesn't use. And Sony was exactly right about that. And they were very careful to push Crash, but never to make Crash the sole mascot of the system. And I think the reason, I, I don't disagree with Andy, I think the reason that Crash may have been the last mascot is because the world was changing, adults were playing games, and Sony rightly saw that change and fought hard not to let Crash ever become the official mascot, while simultaneously based on what everyone else had done up until that point. And that was the transition. And from that point on, when Microsoft came out, they said, there's no way we're going to have a mascot like that. There's just no way because we're an entertainment system. We're not a character. And so there won't be a mascot again. That's true. And it, um, actually thinking about that in lots of the, the early PlayStation, the marketing of it, it, was, it wasn't necessarily a single person representing or single character representing playstation it was always like an ensemble so you had crash but you had also other characters from that's games right at that time so they were very careful to always say hey it's not all kids games look at twisted metal we'll put that up or look at this and look at that and you know sony america actually initially wanted a mascot they thought it was necessary so there was something called polygon man which again you can find online it's a guy with huge pointed polygons coming out of his head and uh the creator of it basically lost his job by pushing that too hard uh, because Sony was adamant. Sony Japan was adamant. This is, it's like the Walkman. The Walkman does not need a mascot. We do not say the Walkman is about name your Madonna or name the character of the moment. It is not the Madonna system. It is a system that happens to play Madonna. But if you don't like Madonna, that's fine. We got heavy metal over here, right? And that's effectively what these consoles have become. They're, you don't have to play all the games and you don't, you don't think of them as a specific game or a specific type of game system. You think of them as entertainment systems. And that was a, it was a very smart move by Sony to do that. I think one of the things that I love about Naughty Dog and the Crash games in particular was the accessibility of them for people of all ages and levels of game playing. Uh, it was the one series of games that me and my brother and my sister all played. And what I loved about it the most, which goes back to the shifting camera angles, that we found that it became a multiplayer game for us because each one of us was better than the other at a certain type of Crash Bandicoot, whether it was the side scrolling, whether it was the boulder levels, whether it was the hog riding. Each of us, where we passed the control around, it became a huge social thing for us. Um, another thing that I felt was an absolute masterstroke as part of that was the dynamic difficulty adjustment. Well, we had this problem because up until that time, most again, most systems were played by kids, and most kids were kind of coming into them at the same time, and then they'd grow out of games or whatever. Um, we had gamers on the PlayStation that had been playing for 15 years, you know, games like me. Uh, we had other gamers that were children. Uh, in Japan, the number one title you bought first if you were under 14 was Crash Bandicoot. And a lot of those kids were coming into games for the first time. And for the first time, we also had people older than me at the time, because I was kind of on the cusp of the game. 40, something like that is, I played 
Pong and I kept, I stuck with it, right? You couldn't be any older than me and have started in games when you were young. They already would have existed. And after me, games had already kind of started establishing themselves. We had people who had never played games before that were older than me that were coming in and saying, hey, this actually interests me for the first time with the PlayStation. And so we had players that were innately used to the button and control mechanism of a controller. And we had players that were utterly lost. And simultaneously, we were doing something much more challenging that we had ever asked people to do before. We were asking them for them for them to deal with stuff in 3D. Uh, and Mario did as well. And the challenge of getting both of those types of players to play the same game hadn't really been faced or no one had really paid that much attention to it before. And what we ended up doing was this dynamic difficulty adjustment where the game uh, would adjust itself based on how well or how poorly you're playing. And I can give a lot of examples of it. Uh, if you weren't playing very well and you were down to the last few of your lives, you got free lives. If you had a lot of free lives, you would get a bunch of wumpa fruit. You wouldn't get any. Um, Mark Cerny made the brilliant, which I'll never forget, deduction that if you're not getting from point A to point B and you have a one in a hundred chance of doing it and you put, you know, based on your skill level, it's going to take a hundred times, which no one's going to do with something a hundred times. If you put a checkpoint halfway through, it's one in 10 to the checkpoint and one in 10 to the other part of it because that effectively makes one in 100. So by putting in a checkpoint, you radically change the difficult, difficulty. You don't make it half as hard. I mean, I'm assuming, obviously, the difficulty is even across the path. If one pit is always killing you, you don't solve it with that. But if difficulty over 20 challenges is even and your chance of getting through each challenge is, is so much, by putting a crate that gives you a continue halfway through, radically changing it. Yeah. So after failing a certain number of times, we decided you had to get on, you had to move on otherwise you're going to leave the game. So a continue crate would pop up. And most people didn't notice. If you died more than say 5 times on a certain challenge, an aku aku would just yeah. pop up when you started. And that meant you got one more death effectively between here and there. Uh so continues were good for pits, aku aku is good for enemies. Um the boulder yeah. uh slows down every time you die. You don't see it. It's imperceptible. But if you play enough times and you die enough times, that boulder's barely rolling. Um, you're going to get through it. Yeah. You're going to get through it. We're going to get you to the next level. And, you know, we, we looked at everything in precisely that manner, uh, trying to make the game harder for good players, but not harder for easy players. And finding ways of doing that is difficult. But that's what we did. And we failed, by the way, on Crash in one specific place. We made you earn continues. And that makes no sense because the people, the people who are good are going to earn them and probably don't need them. And the people that are bad are not going to earn them and they're not going to have continues and you're going to lose them. And between Sonic, which made you start over, yeah. if you remember when you were playing yeah. Sonic, and Crash, where we were trying to give you continues but didn't do it right, to Crash 2 when we finally figured out it's the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah, give yeah. continues to the people who are dying. Take them away in some way from the people that are really good. Um that the game industry went from punitive, which Sonic was punitive, uh, to helping bad players. Um, and that and that worked. It worked really, really well. And most people had no idea we were doing it. And it's funny because a lot of game designers still to this day say, that's a failure of design on your part. You should have created a game that works for everybody. Um, and there are a lot of games out there now that, that would the designers would absolutely refuse to do what I just said. Um, but it really worked for Crash. I think it really did. And I love the fact that unlike lots of games where you have that ch that classic choice of easy, normal, or hard, everyone starts Crash at the same level. They may There may be peaks and troughs of their, the difficulty throughout, but I love the fact that the game almost adapts to you. I really like yep. that. And, it's not and, that's, and that's the big philosophical debate, because a lot of designers I speak to say, why wouldn't you just make it easy, medium, or hard and let people choose? And my answer to that is, I hate easy, medium, hard, because I always assume I'm a medium player. And if medium's too hard for me, I feel defeated. I'm not going to go back and play it on easy. I'm offended, and I'm going to walk away. If I start it on easy and it's too easy... Uh, I'm not going to go back and play on medium. And hard is really your second time through, right? So it just, it to me, that's a bad way of doing it. Now, there are games now that are saying, hey, you failed a few times. Would you like to put it in easy mode? Okay, that works better than just an easy, medium, or hard one switch. But you're also kind of saying, hey, you suck, very obviously. I'd much rather say, here's a free life, or here's an Aku Aku mask, and you might or might not notice yeah. it, but... 
And, and by the way, if you start ki killing it in the game, you're not going to have any more Aku Aku masks. Those continue crates are going to go away. You're not going to get lives. So it self-adjusts as you're going to make sure the player can get through it. It does sacrifice the purity that if you are an incredibly good player, it may at one point or another in the game give you some help that you didn't want and you wanted to get through it on your own. I admit that. But shy of that failing, I think it's a pretty good system for dealing with people. And on the whole, it doesn't patronize the player. I mean, I mean, there could be a lot of people listening to this who are actually going to go and replay Crash and look for it because that's what I did as soon as I, I, because I hadn't noticed about it at all, and it's just such a wonderful feeling because sometimes when you're playing games, you like like life in general, you have down days, you just you're not concentrating properly. Sometimes we need a hand, you know. To give look, it. the way I look at it, if you if you needed help, it is as much my failing for my design and the other designers as it is your failing for having not gotten through whatever level it is that that created that. But it is a way of of creating a system where you're going to be happy. And you're you're going to be you're going to get through the game if you want to put in the time. And we're not going to help you with, by the way, some of it. If you go back for gems, we're not, you know, we're, we're not helping you there. You want 100 percent, you got to earn 100 percent. But the basic game, which still to this day, most games, a lot of people don't finish. A good majority don't finish. We let you finish Crash if you put in the time by by making it easier. And you know, I I think it was a good idea, and it definitely worked. I'm not saying it's the only way of going about it. Uh, but it definitely worked for us. Uh, finally, I just wanted to ask, do you still see elements of Crash in Naughty Dog's canon? And is there any aspects of Crash Bandicoot that have been carried on through Naughty Dog's um, canon of games? You know, I want to be very careful. I didn't work on uh, Uncharted at all. Uh, in fact, um, in the last year that I worked at Naughty Dog, I was not in the big office. Evan was because I wanted the transition to be smooth and everybody to understand that Evan was the future and Evan was making the decisions. We consulted each other that year heavily. Uh, I had looked at everything we were doing on the game on, on Jack 3, um, but I did not look at Uncharted at all, even though it was there were preliminary, very preliminary things going on. And the reason for that was I never wanted to take credit for anything they did with those games, and I also didn't want the blame if things didn't <laughs> go right after I left, right? So I absolutely have to be very careful not to take any credit for anything they've done with those games. They're absolutely fantastic, but they are 100% the talent of the people that were there after I left. Um, having said that, I said when Uncharted 2 came out that it was the culmination of the project that we wanted to make when we started with Crash. The original Crash design had story. It had interstitial sequences. Um, you know, it was supposed to be more like a, or as much like a movie as it was like a game. At the end of the first level when you end up with the boss Aku Aku or at the end of the level where you end up fighting Aku Aku, there was supposed to be a sequence where you got to the end, slid down a slope, bounced off a log, flipped in the air, smashed through a roof, and there was Aku Aku to fight. Now, we utterly failed for technical reasons, time reasons, and budget reasons to get any of that in the game. But the idea was there with Crash Bandicoot to give it some sort of story and to interweave story and game. Crash 2 got better, Crash 3 got better, Jack got a lot better, but it really only had story at the beginning, middle, and end. Jack 2 now was a very different game, which finally got a lot of story and gave you a reason for doing every level, um, did string sequences together, did have video interspliced inter uh, with the gameplay. Um, but again, PlayStation 2 wasn't really there from a technical standpoint, and we didn't have the budgets and the time uh, to do that stuff. Jack 3, again, in that progression. And then finally, after I left, Uncharted in many ways, granted it's a totally different character, totally different style, it's adult as opposed to, uh, you know, character action of the classic sense, finally got that gameplay, which we were trying to do all along. Uh, and obviously Evan came through most of that, so he was very aware of, of what we were trying to do. They finally had the ability with the PlayStation 3 to realize that vision. Um, Uncharted 1, I know they struggled like we do on every first title with a new IP. With the new IP, they struggled. They struggled with new hardware. PlayStation 3 wasn't the easiest thing to tackle. Um, but with Uncharted 2, finally, 
Uh, and I remember writing this in a congratulatory article, I think it was, to them. They finally got the vision that we had from Crash done, and it was fantastic. Um, and obviously, uh, at this point, they're now on their own vision, charting their own course, doing utterly different things. And again, I take no credit for the culmination of that of that journey, but definitely that was the journey that we were all on. Um, and they got it. They finally got it right. And I think if you look at the industry, they really got that right better and faster and first, uh, better and faster than other developers and first. And there are definitely many arguments for not having story in game, but if you want to do it, it's hard to beat that. It's yeah. hard to beat Uncharted. Yeah. So in that way, I think Crash comes through, um, you know, obviously in few others. Uh, it's uh, Uncharted is is a very different game. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of very course. Much. Thank you very much for giving your time for this. Uh, no, no, that's all right. And it's uh, it's always fantastic going and talking about the old days. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I'm I'm 43. Uh, I was like 23, 24 when we started Crash. So it's almost half a life. Yeah. Away. It's been a long time. And looking at how much the industry has changed since then, it's unbelievable. Oh yeah. I remember when PlayStation came out for the first time, the rest of the world looked at video games. From the, Up until that point, it was a kid's toy, sold at Toys R Us. Um, and I remember trying to explain to other people at Universal why a, v, you know, a VCR or a DVD player uh, couldn't play video games and explaining to them why games made sense. And they always kind of smirked and said, you know, I'm in the music group or I'm in the movie group and you guys are cute, but... Games is always going to be this little niche market. And I always knew that games were going to be, if not the dominant, one of the dominant um, forms of entertainment. Well, that brings us to the end of the beginning as we draw this first chapter of our Naughty Dog in Retrospect to a close. If you've liked what you've heard, then feel free to let us know by rating us on iTunes. It would really mean a lot to us if you did. Anyway, if we whet your appetite for all things Naughty Dog, then there's more next week. Visit inretrospectpodcast.com, give us a like on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at inretweetspect. My thanks to Jason once again for kicking off this special with a suitable degree of awesomeness, and thank you, listener, for tuning in. Anyways, I'm off to replay Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped, and I'll see you all at the final show of the special. Bye! In the next episode of Naughty Dog in Retrospect, Peter joins Jack and Daxter as they propel Naughty Dog towards a creative vision realised during the PlayStation 3 era. Cool! Check out all the dead stuff! Ow! Touch the goods again, rat boy, and you'll be... (coughs) counting with your toes! That's all to come next time on Naughty Dog in Retrospect.